Welcome, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number three, querying knowledge graphs with Sparkle. In this section of the lecture I will show you that Sparkle is more than just a query language, as we have already experienced it. Okay, Sparkle of course is the Sparkle protocol and RDF query language and it's now already available in the version 1.1. And if you look at the extensive documentation, there are 11 documents, 11 W3C recommendations, which define, of course, all the subtleties that are available or possible via Sparkle. So this is not only a query language, as you see here, but also the output format is explained. And then you also have the possibility to manipulate your data. So there is also a Sparkle update service and Spark like that. And we have a Sparkle protocol, which takes care of transporting Sparkle queries and results back and forth between client and server. And this is a stuff that we will have a look on just now. OK, so let me turn on the laser pointer. And let's start. We start with a Sparkle output format. So imagine we would have a table as a result, as you see here, where we have here influencer label, book label, and author count. And there we have uh, authors, of course, listed and books. And um, yeah, what this author count number is, I can't tell you, but it's 20 and we want to encode it, of course. The most simple way that Sparkle offers you is to return its results in the way of a CSV file, a comma separated value uh, list that might be um, look like here. But of course, if you get it back, it's not colored. Um, you see here simply the labels of the columns on the top. So we have influencer label, book label, author count, all separated by comma. And then come simply with the results. You see here a string, Robert Louis Stevenson, of course, it's here in English. And then the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in English. And then we have here a number 20. And this again, here is the namespace for the XML data type. And this is uh, an integer data type. And in that, say, in that way, you would receive your output list. And this is, of course, rather simple to, to parse and then also to reuse in whatever application you want to include your Sparkle query and your Sparkle results into it. OK, but there is also, let's say, a more elaborate format, for example, here, an XML-based format. So Sparkle is able to return to you an XML document, and this is then formatted in the following way. You see then here in the header part all of the variables that should be contained in the table that is returned. And then if you look deeper after the header part, there follows the results part. And of course, it can be several results. And one of the results, so a single Sparkle query result, then consists of several bindings. Let's have a look at the bindings. Each binding is bound or binds here a variable. It's given here by its name to then the value of the variable. And here we see Robert, uh, here we see Robert Louis Stevenson. That's a literal and it's given in English and you see how it's uh, enclosed, enclosed there. The next one would be book name in exactly the same way and then you have here a binding for the author count which is given then as an integer data type and there you see literal data type and the data type there is of course then uh, the XML schema integer data type and then follows simply 20. So this is the way how the output format would be um, formatted or encoded for Sparkle in XML. Last but not least, of course, if you are a programmer, you might be already familiar with JSON. There is also a JSON-based format. And this simply reads in the same way like the first list that you saw. That's a JSON document where exactly these columns here are encoded as the variables, influencer label, book label, and author count. And then you see here the according bindings that reference each single row that is here um, given back as a result in the table. And that, of course, can also easily be parsed again. So that's the Sparkle output formats. There are more possible ways to output Sparkle, but these are the most important that we wanted to share with you. Looking at the Sparkle protocol that takes care of the communication between client and server, this is, of course, a protocol that is in the layer above the HTTP protocol. So it uses HTTP, the hypertext transfer protocol, for the web-based communication between client and server. And what you do simply there, of course, you call uh, a URI. 
which contains on the one hand side, of course, the URL of the Sparkle endpoint. In our case, this would be simply example.org slash Sparkle. Don't try it out, that server doesn't exist. And then, of course, it also transmits the Sparkle or the graph that we, that we are going to query. Because on that Sparkle endpoint, there might reside several graphs. And of course, we have to name it in some way. So that's the red part here. So I have here uh, an attribute which is called named graph URI. And that we assign here exactly uh, a specific graph that is here called testRDF.RDF. And then in green, we have to encode our Sparkle query. And since this is transported as a URL, of course, then uh, the Sparkle query, which might contain blanks or also other kind of signs that are usually not used in a, in a URL, it has to be URL encoded, as you see here. So our query is URL encoded, and this is exactly the URL that you transmit to the Sparkle endpoint, and then the result will be given back to you. So what happens there? So let's see, we have here a simple Sparkle query. So again here we are looking for authors and their notable works and we want to limit it to 100. That would look then, if you transmit it via HTTP to the Sparkle server, in the following way. So this is an HTTP GET request. And then you have to say, uh, uh, state the URI or URL that you want to query. Again, you see here, um, we access here a specific Sparkle server. That's the graph we are uh, accessing, that's the DBpedia here in that sense. And then uh, we uh, simply format here our query in green as URL encoded query. And of course we have to, uh, since this is an HTTP request, we have to say, okay, what is the host and what would be then the result format that we are looking for. And we can give several result formats depending on what the server then selects to uh, give us back. So that would be the HTTP trace of exactly that kind of query. So we have already learned the output format and the protocol. Now we come to the point to tell you or to show you that with Sparkle you are not only able to do, let's say, simple select queries. So what else can we do? We can ask Sparkle whether for a specific query an answer exists or not. You might ask yourself, yeah, is this somehow, does this make any sense? Can't I do simply a straight select statement for that? Of course you could, but when you are a bit more experienced, you will see that some queries might take a long time to return a result. And many of the publicly available endpoints, they might have a timeout limit. And therefore your query won't ever finish and you have no idea whether it would deliver an answer or not. So that might be, for example, a case when exactly this option, this asked option, is a very good option for you. So the next thing we learn is Sparkle Ask. And this is simply for checking out whether there is at least one result or not. And it simply returns true. It's returned when, when there is a result and false in the case there is no result. And the results then usually are again delivered as XML or JSON, so the true and the false. So let's have a look here. We have again um, a query that is here to, to Wikidata. So what we are trying to do is, is there an author with a notable work? So again, just look at the query. We say the author should have the occupation writer. We say that notable work, th which is a book. And uh, of course, this notable work should be of instance book because we are not interested, for example, in paintings or other kind of artwork. Let's try it out on the Sparkle endpoint. So you see the query here, and we simply carry it out, and you see then here what is returned. I will increase the size a little bit here. What is returned is simply here the value true. That's all. So you see that works pretty well, and you are free to play around with it. Besides ask, there is also another option which is called describe. What is describe? Compared to a usual Sparkle query, which gives you back exactly what you have asked for, Describe gives you the possibility to show you all available data about the resources that are returned from your Sparkle query. So all triples that are associated with the entities that you are querying for. So the, resu the result is an RDF graph with data about resources that would be uh, usually the result of your query. 
So let's have a look at the qu uh, query example here. So show all available data about authors and their notable works. And this can be solved with a describe query. And we want to have authors and books, and they should be described. And again, of course, it's exactly the same query that we had before. We want only see 1,000 results, which means all information about these authors and books that are part of uh, the result of that query. So let's have a look. Here is the query. I carry it out and I make it a bit smaller. And you see here, you get triples back, which is all of the triples that are here, for example, uh, available for exactly that subject, which is, as we see here, most likely David Herbert Lawrence. And there are many triples available for that guy, for that author. So that was describe. Let's go one step further. Besides not only giving back subject, predicates and object, you can really construct your own new RDF and can give a template according to which exactly this should be constructed. And that comes quite handy, for example, if you want to analyze things that are in a graph and then create new triples out of it. So exactly for that case, construct is the thing that you should choose. And the template that you give is a graph pattern that contains variables from the query pattern. Again, the result will be given back in RDF XML or Turtle. So let's have a look at our example. What we want to do is we want to create new RDF triples for authors and their notable work. So exactly the same query, but now in a construct environment where we say here after construct here in curly brackets, you see here the pattern that we give it. And the pattern contains here the author variable. And then we give it an explicit property here. So this is has written from our example namespace. And then there should be the book and we close everything here by a period. So it's a new triple. So we want to see the first 10 triples that are delivered back from that query. So let's see how this works on the Sparkle endpoint. And you see, so this are the triples that have been created. The subject should be authors. This is the predicate has written, as we have stated in the template. And these are then the books we are talking about. So this is Sparkle Construct. And after Sparkle Construct, of course, we won't show you now how you update and manipulate Sparkle, but it works exactly in the same way. And there is even more because you can also influence the entire triple store with loading entire schema data or in bunches of data. You can load a triple store and you can, of course, also delete an entire graph and stuff like that. But if you are interested in that, simply look it up in the references we have given you in the beginning. You should now have already, let's say, a rather experienced knowledge of how to query Sparkle and also how to use Sparkle in different environments. One question that we still have to solve is quality assurance. Quality assurance in the sense that for the structures we are dealing with, to find out whether they are complete, for example, or whether they contain flaws, whether data is missing there. And for that, there is a specific language, which is the shackle language. And we will be looking on that in the next lecture.